I read Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell, The Story of Success. When I was first recommended this book, I was thinking, I wonder what the story of success is. Well, how does everyone become successful? Why do people become successful? And again, this book highlights that. And I'm looking forward to getting into it with you guys. So the introduction starts with something called the Rosetto Mystery, and it also describes about what an outlier is. An outlier is something that is situated away from or classed differently than the main thing. So for example, if there's 10 people in a room and nine of them like green, but one of them likes blue. The one person who likes blue is the outlier. That is the most simple example that I can give. So again, it could be a statistical observation in where you look at a group and there's one thing or two things in a large group where why did they do it this way? Why is this happening with those one or two people? Again, a statistical outlier. And this first introduction chapter talks about Rosetto, a city in Italy in where people immigrated from this Rosetto area to roughly around the Bangor, PA area. Again, it's sort of located near from where I grew up. So I was really interested and thought, okay, like what's so different about this Rosetto community in Bangor, PA? So basically a doctor found out that a lot of people under 65 in this area didn't get heart disease, even though they ate pretty unhealthy, they had lard, they had fats, oils, et cetera, et cetera, but they weren't getting heart disease under 65. So he was curious as to why, did they have a specific gene or was it a way of life? So what was it? So he decided to investigate and try to figure out as to why. He found out that again, the people in the area didn't have any forms of alcoholism or heart disease or anything of the sorts. But the odd thing was, is 41% of their diet came from fats. A lot of them were smokers and lived pretty unhealthy lifestyles. So why were they not getting heart disease? So basically the studies concluded that mainly the people who, again, immigrated from Italy and were in this area were all under the same roof. They were all super communal. There was a sense of community. They were super healthy spiritually and mentally and emotionally because they had family community instilled in their environment. So they thought that, wait, maybe the community is what really kept them healthy. This is interesting to me because again, people always say how your environment can really make or break you. So it's interesting because again, it talks about health in the terms and form of community. So it kind of got me thinking, I was like, maybe nowadays, are we not around people enough? Is that why there's more illnesses? People get sick when they're alone. So it kind of made me realize and start thinking about the book and what it was introducing, which I thought was pretty interesting. So chapter one. Chapter one starts with a quote and it's called the Matthew effect. And the quote states, and he shall have abundance, but from him that hath shall not be taken away even that which he hath. Obviously it's more old English and it's a little bit of confusing of a quote. So within this first chapter, it basically starts talking about athletes. And it talks about when you have a lot of skill and you're really good at the sport, you'll become successful. You'll be really excellent. You'll become a professional athlete. But then it kind of dives into the statistics of hockey players and statistics of when you're born and when the cutoff date is. So basically, why are most hockey players or some professional athletes born from January to April? And they, they looked at these statistics, looked at these studies, and were like, wait a minute, the cutoff date is January. So the oldest person in, let's say, 1998 class, so it's like, eight boys team, the earlier people are going to be older than the December guys who are in the same age group bracket. So they'll have what, seven, eight months more of development than the kids in December, November, October. So more of them will get selected to be in the travel team because they're older, bigger, faster. Because obviously an eight-year-old boy is way different than a nine-year-old boy. So even that one year gap can allow certain kids to get those hours and hours extra of practice to be on that travel team. And it in turn makes them become a professional because again, they're getting better hours. They're getting better competition, better coaching. So again, obviously it's skill barriers. You have to gain the skill to become a professional, but to even get into the room for the skill to be born from January to April means that you have a higher rate of becoming a professional because you have a higher rate of being selected by those coaches. And again, this book dives into business tycoons, social media people, artists, dancers. It didn't even matter what avenue you went down. It talks about this cutoff date. It talks about what does it take for all these different types of people to become very successful. Again, this book talks about what does it take to actually become successful. An interesting part of the book so far in this chapter has told me that people don't rise from nothing. It's not an accident if someone becomes super successful. And this was really interesting in the book because it made me realize, wait a minute. So there's no such thing as self-made because you had to have something, whether it be family lineage, your environment, the connections you have, the money, the resources. And it does a really cool quote where it says, it's not about the seed, but it's about the sunlight. And then it made me start thinking, wait, this is really interesting because in life, that is how it is. We have to have the foundation and then get that sunlight to actually allow ourselves to grow. And again, this is why our environment is so important. So again, the ending of this chapter basically, again, just talks about the summation of that professional athlete example, that all these professional athletes are being born in these earlier months. So think about 
a bunch of different things and where, when is a cutoff for school? When is a cutoff for this? When is a cutoff for that? And when you get the older kids, then they in turn get this more practice, more exposure. And again, it kind of shows as to the selection of yourself in this travel team is what allows you to succeed. That environment allows you to go pro, not just your birthday, but again, when it is your birthday, it gives you the extra edge, the extra step into the path. And that was basically the summation of chapter one. So again, it introduces us and tells us basically that software programmers to dancers, to singers, to artists, to again, athletes, all of them kind of go through this rule that no matter what it is, there's something that gives them the path to success. So chapter one starts and talks about mainly this one topic, the 10,000 hour rule. So within this whole chapter, it talks about the 10,000 hour rule. And for me personally, when I was reading through this, I kept thinking, well, this is insane. Like it's so simple to understand this. The Mamba mentality, Kobe Bryant always talked about this, that he just did way more work than everyone else did. Even though they were all professionals, he outworked other professionals, was always in the gym hours and hours a day more than his opponents. Athletes like Cristiano Ronaldo would do this. They'd be the first ones to be at training and the last ones to leave. The best athletes, the best performers in anything, put in the time, put in your 10,000 hours. And again, 10,000 hours equates to eight hours a day, five days a week, basically around seven, eight years. So it makes sense like, okay, it takes years to become an expert at any craft or skill. The more time you put in behind something, the better you're gonna get at it. So when I was reading this chapter, really put it in perspective that anyone, anyone watching this or anyone in the world can become an expert at something. And it just requires you to put in the work. And personally, it made me think this is awesome. But again, within the book, it also keeps talking about how then you need the environment to allow you to get those 10,000 hours. So for example, if you weren't privileged enough to be on a travel team and pay $2,000 a year to be on this travel team, then that was a barrier of entry for you. It was harder to get those 10,000 hours of team practices. You can maybe train alone, but it's nothing like when you're training with a team, a coach that can get you to the next level, that has the connections to get you into other teams, to play for the USA Olympic development team. So again, there's layers to this, there's levels to it. In chapter one, it focuses and talks about a guy named Bill Joy, who is basically the Thomas Edison of the internet. He's one of the most influential people in the modern CPU era. He also co-founded Sun Microsystem Silicon Valley Company. So again, he was a co-founder of a pretty big company, and again, Silicon Valley in those early 50s. And this company that he co-founded was critical in the revolution of, again, CPUs and what we see about technology, internet, and CPUs. Then it talks about a topic of innate talent. And it basically took a group of violinists, first group, second group, and a third group. He labeled them as the first group as like the stars, the extraordinary players. The second group was like, they were good, they're really quality, but you know, they were anything like extraordinary or special. And the third group were just good average violinists. They did a study and asked all these different violinists, how much hours have you probably practiced? So the most excellent ones had roughly around 10,000 hours by the time they were 20. The next group had around 8,000 hours by the time they were 20. And then the last group had around 4,000 to 6,000 hours by the time they were 20. So obviously in doing all this, they couldn't find anyone that was just a natural and picked up the violin and was legendary. That just didn't happen, which kind of makes sense. It's not like you can pick up doing any skill or any instrument and just instantly be perfect at it or excellent. I was like, you know what, that makes sense. Again, it goes back to that put in the hours, put in the work to become successful at something and you'll get there. You will just have to put in the hours, the work. And again, 406 days is 10,000 hours. Obviously you can't use anything 24 seven. So if you were to break it down, those 10,000 hours, eight hours a day would roughly be around seven years. So again, it kind of goes to show that if you really do put in those work shifts within seven years, you're gonna become super successful at something. What it is you wanna become successful at whether it be a job, a skill, a career, whatever it is, you get to choose. Try to find something in where 10,000 hours you could put in that time in and become an expert at it, a master at it. And it's different because those guys who were the violinists who were doing it had these hours by the time they were 20, which kind of goes show those early formidable years of your life are really important in order to master something early so that you put in those hours and time when you have more free time available to you. Even when it comes down to Bill Joy, there was obviously a bit of luck that gets involved when it comes to where he ended up going to school. He ended up going to school in Michigan. So Michigan actually was one of the only schools that had like a computer and like the supercomputer in that earlier time that he was able to do it. So again, he was a cheat code to him. He learned how to code, he learned to do all these things before anyone even had the opportunity to learn. So again, he was super early to it. And not only that he was super early to it, but again, he applied himself and put in those hours. And basically there was something within the school system where you had to pay for an hour of use. But the trick was someone figured out that within like 
applying for it and scheduling time, if you did like equals K something in the code or in the program, it gave you unlimited hours basically. So he would just do this over and over and over and over and over again and basically jig the system for himself, which makes sense because honestly, at the end of the day, you finesse to get to the next level. Even if it's, you just found a loophole in the system, people do it all the time to get ahead. But again, it required that for him to get those 10,000 hours by the time he had left Michigan or even after, right? So again, it kind of goes to show that you take advantage of the opportunities that have been given to you. And again, Bill Joy, when he was basically interviewed and was talking about this, he was saying that he was literally programming eight to 10 hours a day without any breaks, like eight, 10 hours a day he was doing this. So again, he was getting those 10,000 hours. Another great example of this was the Beatles. And the Beatles basically had an opportunity to go perform in Hamburg. And they were performing there every day, eight hours a day. Think about that, eight hours a day performing. By the time they went back to England after all those eight hours, eight hours, eight hour shifts that they were just performing, 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 think about how excellent they were at performing. They put in so many hours in doing it. So they knew how to work a crowd. They knew how to move around. They knew how to sing their songs really well. They were so good at what they did because they put in the hours, they put in the work. So Bill Gates, when he was in eighth grade, 1968, he had a lot of privilege. He got to code at that age, but how? His mom was a banker, his dad was a lawyer. So again, he was pretty well off. It's not like he didn't have money. He sent him to an elitist private high school and school. And being in this elitist system, again, they had money. His peers had money. The parents of his peers had money. So he went to the Lakeside Middle School and this middle school was one of the only middle schools that offered and promoted a computer. So the mothers of that school system were basically able to pay for these CPU fees. And then when the money ran out of like the funds and like the PTA or whatever it is they had, there was a mom that actually worked at C-Cubed, which needed kids to do code at their computers and was basically hiring them on as interns. So imagine that because they had a mom who worked at this company that also needed someone to code and they also were one of these only middle schools with a computer it kind of just shows boom step by step by step how the opportunity the privilege allowed for these kids to then go be coders and learn at cq there's like interns up to these kids who are little whizzes they were learning really fast and when you're a kid it's a lot easier for you to learn things so it's interesting to see that yeah he became this super successful person when made microsoft but look at how it started it started from eighth grade where he had the opportunity to be one of the only kids around the entire united states who got the ability to code so again it comes down to privilege. It comes down to having that opportunity in the first place to then getting your 10,000 hours. And it has this amazing quote, extraordinary opportunity creates extraordinary talent. The ending of this chapter basically talks about billionaires and when they were born. And a lot of these billionaires were born within nine years of each other, especially these earlier tech billionaires that had originally come up. And it was showing as to why it mattered as to when you were born and when the sweet spot is. So Gage and these other founders were born from 1953 to 1956. So being born in that time allowed you to be in the sweet spot of when you were like in that college, high school range, those computers and all those earlier things were out basically, but were still so new that you had to be an early innovator to it. But they had that opportunity. I tend to wonder and think, when do you guys think is going to be the movers and shakers of our generation, of the Gen Z? If I had to guess, it had to be sometime probably between 1994, 1995 to 2000. Like, that's just kind of where I see it fit. And granted, I might fall in this category, but I just have a feeling that it was those kids that had the time of growing up with the internet, but not enough in where when you were born, you already had the internet so pop culture in, in everyone's hands. And none of them are iPad kids because we didn't have iPads. When I was in seventh and eighth grade, the fastest phone you had was an iPhone 3 or an iPhone 3GS. Again, in the eighth, ninth grade, those phones didn't have anything. It was like a glorified iPod basically. So again, it's kind of that culture where these kids are playing outside on their bikes. These kids are playing Fortnite in their rooms. So again, there's a difference. So I tend to think that maybe there's gonna be the sweet spot in the middle. So again, the summation of this chapter is basically explaining that your environment is what really allowed them to succeed. They were in the West Coast. They were in these tech hub areas that allowed them to succeed. It was the time they were born. It was the time frame. It was the parents they had. It was the people they worked with. It was the people they were in school with. It was all these different things that allowed them to get and succeed to the next level. Chapter three is titled Trouble with Geniuses, part one. The chapter starts with the game show of 1v100. And it's really interesting because I love this show. I love watching this show. And I thought it was like such a fun show to watch because you went against the mob. And it was one person going against the mob. And questions kept coming to you and the mob. And you had to basically outlast the mob. And it was a really dope show. And I thought it was such an interesting show. And I've always wanted to be on it. Like, oh, 1v1. It just seems like such a cool, like, game show. And it, this book starts the chapter talking about it. And it talks about a guest that was on the show called Chris Langan. And 
It talked about how intelligent he was and all these different things. Basically, he didn't even end up going to the million dollars. He stopped at $250,000 because he said, even if, if he were to lose after that, it would, wouldn't be more beneficial to him, mathematically speaking, than if he just takes the 250 and walks away. He might have even been able to win the 500 and million, but he just knew it was mathematically smarter to do the 250. But he did excellent, didn't make a mistake, obviously, and was brilliant. But it talks about him within this chapter. And the main focus on this chapter is this really interesting study. And it started with a guy named Henry Cow, And he was an unschooled person. He didn't go to school, but he was a janitor at Stanford. And he basically would sneak in and play on the piano a little bit. And people noticed how he was talented and he was really spending hours and he was good at it. So a guy named Lewis Terman saw him and wondered how many diamonds in the rough are there that kind of just escaped the system or the system doesn't help them out or the product of their environment doesn't help them out. So how many diamonds in the rough really were there? So then he, what he basically does, he gets a large sample size of all these different people, gets IQ tests for these kids. And he wants to basically find out who are going to be the future movers and shakers. Can you use IQ tests and these different standardized tests to basically predict who's going to be super successful? Successful. He wanted to figure out who was going to be the Nobel Prize winner, who's going to be rich, who's going to be successful, who's not going to be successful. And can you measure it just based off of these tests or IQ? He then in turn followed all these kids' journeys for years to come. His studies, however, proved to not be that accurate and to be pretty wrong. He didn't realize the real outlier that was going to be taking place here. They figured out that any IQ point after 120 didn't help more or less in becoming more successful which sort of makes sense because if you have a sort of base level of intelligence that's 120, from 120 to 140 to 150, there isn't really much more that's going to help you become successful in this world. But what is going to help you become successful in this world is something else. For example, in basketball, after a certain height, you can go pro. Yeah, obviously you can't be a five foot five professional NBA player. There are seven footers, there are 6'10", 6 6'11". 6 These people that are super tall, obviously it's going to be easier for them to be getting to the rim, blocking your shots. So after a certain height, you're probably just not going to help you any more than if you're even taller or not. Can you still have to be athletic and agile and mobile? I kind of feel like if you're at least like, what, 6'4", six, 6'5", six, you have a great chance of getting into the NBA if you're super athletic still, work out and get real good at it. Because again, there's like that cap. Right? After that height, what's the difference between 6'5 and 6'7? Some of the best NBA players ever to play aren't even 6'5". So again, it kind of goes to show that it works out that way. Then the chapter summarizes and ends with talking about the Nobel Prize and why certain schools have more Nobel Prize winners. But then it goes to show that there's different schools like DePau or Gettysburg College and where they have Nobel Prize winners too. So they might not be as prestigious as Harvard or Yale or Columbia, but how do they also have Nobel Prize winners? So what's the statistic that kind of created these Nobel Prize winners? What was they see the barrier of entry to getting a Nobel? And there was an interesting study in where they had at the University of Michigan where they had basically white and black students and they studied them and saw that most of the black students were less, were less privileged, obviously. Obviously for many factors that we can get into at another time, but we all kind of sort of know there's obviously gonna be some disparities as well. So they didn't have the same ability and high raw scores, but when they were both in the same environment, the white and black students, when they looked at those same students after, even though the white students had a higher raw score when they got in versus the black students, after they realized the black students did just as well in the real world, and if not better, after college. So again, just being in that environment took them out. But the hard part is getting in. The hard part is being in an environment that allows you to succeed. So again, this goes back and shows the same thing of the IQ threshold where any points after 120 didn't really matter. The same way that if you at least got into the school and you're part of the program, it didn't matter. You will still be able to be successful at the same rate and if not better than someone with 100 I4 versus 120. Or if you had a raw threshold score of 50 versus 45. So this is how chapter three ends. So an interesting part in this chapter was this brick and blanket question. And it basically asked the question that was, how many different ways can you use a brick and a blanket? And I'll give you a second to basically think about that. How many ways can you use a brick and a blanket? The logical nerd analytical answer to this question would be, oh, building, throwing it, the blanket, covering up with, keeping warm. But the imaginative mind would be saying things like, you can use the brick as a spaceship that's traveling around the world and the blanket can wrap around it and swing around like a boomerang and see how we're going here. So again, it's being able to have a fertile mind is more important than just having an analytical mind. Again, a fertile mind is allowing for growth. A fertile mind is trying to be creative, imaginative, critical thinking skills. Having analytical skills is great, but there's a little more to it when you have that fertile mind that he was talking about. So again, that's why Terman was wrong. 
he had two Nobel Prize winners in his study, but the field workers who were doing the IQ tests didn't select those two kids who actually ended up winning Nobel Prizes because their IQs weren't high enough. So it goes to show that he was looking for the Nobel Prize winners in his, these IQ tests, but couldn't find them. Why? Because they weren't above 120 IQ points, but they still won Nobels. So it goes to show that an analytical statistics isn't the most important thing when it comes to be getting a Nobel Prize. To become successful, to become something of yourself, it doesn't just require analytical testing, but it requires something else, something more. So chapter four is Trouble with Geniuses part two. And this one was really interesting because it talks about two figures here, one who was a poor genius and one who was a rich genius. So the two that we're talking about here, we'll be focusing on within the book is Chris Langan. Chris Langan is going to be the guy who his mother had four kids, all from different dads. His dad evaded Mexico, evaded to Mexico when he was born, passed away. Who knows what happened to him? But he was going through a way tougher time in life, a lot more struggle. And it goes and talks about his life within the story and says things like he ended up getting into school, but didn't do the financial aid, didn't fill out the forms, didn't know what to do, didn't have like the social skills and the personable skills to basically ask the financial officer office what to do to have for help. He didn't know what to do, so he ended up failing out. This guy was a classified genius, but ended up failing out of college. How did that happen? Just because he didn't have those personal skills, just because he didn't know how to communicate with people like that. He didn't have that foundation growing up in order to finesse his way in, finagle, use the system for his advantage, and communicate things that he needed. He didn't have those skills. So even though he was a genius, he didn't he wasn't able to actually live up to his true potential. And he talks about this. And he says yeah, he basically flunked out of schools and couldn't do anything after that. And even if he wanted to go to Harvard and apply himself there and do all those things, he didn't have the resources to be able to do it. And he even talked about it like even now after his whole experiences, he could be studying and doing all the most amazing things and has loves philosophy and reading and all these different high level intricate studies, but he can't even publish anything because he's not a graduate. So how could he publish something? How could he really be credible? And again, Langan always talked about how systems were all about bureaucracy and all about the endowment money and that you had to listen to Big Brother and that he had to tell you what to do and what to say. So he never wanted to get into it anyways. The second person we're going to talk about is Oppenheimer. And he was, again, a rich kid from Manhattan. And he, again, was classified as a genius, an intelligent person. But he had privilege. So let's see how different within this chapter it talks about the two different characters here, where it shows one who's Poor genius versus rich genius. It even kind of introduces Oppenheimer as someone who tried to poison his tutor before. So when I first read that, I'm like, what? Like, this guy is a nut job. But then it explains that geniuses basically live off of this instability in their mind even. Because again, you're not just a straight, straight edged sword. You're kind of a double edged sword. There's two different things about you. It's like to be a real genius, you have to be a little bit crazy. People always talk about this. But the difference was Oppenheimer had this practical intelligence. He was able to finesse his way through the world. He was able to communicate, talk. Because again, he had the privilege growing up to having those resources, to be able to do those things. It's interesting because a person who knew him said he couldn't even run a hamburger stand if he tried. But then he went on to build basically an atomic bomb in the 20th century. Crazy. So again, this chapter really focuses and talks about the difference between practical intelligence and analytical intelligence. Intelligence. And practical intelligence, again, is being able to talk to your professors, to be able to schmooze your way in a conversation. And analytical intelligence is how well you are taking tests. And you kind of have to have a nice balance of these two to become super successful, it seems. If you have all the analytical intelligence and don't have the practical intelligence, you could end up in a situation where you don't really know how to get that scholarship reward back. You don't know how to talk to financial aid. You don't know how to do this. How to... So again, it puts you in this really tough situation. But again, that practical intelligence can really help you open doors for yourself. So having a mix of the two is going to be really beneficial for you. So again, another example of this is analytical is the read, write, and being able to do those different types of analytical tests. And the practical intelligence is what comes from your family, how they teach you to communicate, how they teach you around the world, how they teach you about how to communicate with others around you, how to play, how to have siblings, for example. Right? That's forms of how to receive practical intelligence. So then the book dives into IQ versus learned intelligence and studies different families. And when it studies these 12 different families, obviously look at different things, race, socio socioeconomic status, and other factors as well. It was found that the rich and middle class students had a structure to their day. There was band practice at this time. There was soccer practice at this time. There was, everything was structured from obviously the parents' influence. They structured their kids' days in order to do actual activities and do different things here, different things there. But the poorer students didn't have that structure. It was more free flowing. Even when it came to the more wealthier students, they tended to argue back with the teachers more. They stood up for themselves a little more. 
they had a sense of entitlement more. So again, all those different factors allowed them to, again, get ahead in certain aspects of practical intelligence. The poor students, however, didn't want to argue with authority. Their parents raised them and basically had them in this like fear mindset where you don't want to get in trouble and ruin your opportunity. You don't want to get in trouble or make problems because you want to just quietly glide on by. But as we see later on in life, that affects them. And again, for example, the poor students, their parents were able to spend time with them with their hobbies and their activities. There was a study showed that one of the girls would walk herself to choir practice. And again, she had to go out of the way to do that activity instead of having mommy and daddy give her a ride to practice. For the poorer kids, play had to happen at home. They had to think of different games. They had to think of different things for fun. So again, they tend to be a little more creative. So again, the middle class children had this advantage. They were able to build all these different skills because their parents gave them structure. They put them in different activities. They put them in soccer practice. They put them in all these different things. So it allowed them to build a lot more natural skill sets. A good example of this is the doctor appointment. So they were able to go to a doctor's appointment and be, hey, doctor, this part hurts, this hurts, this hurts, this hurts. And yeah, a 10 year old was able to basically blab on about what actually hurts and speak up. But the poor kid wasn't doing that. Or, yep, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. But again, it's because of that same dichotomy of understanding they didn't want to cause problems. They, didn't, they wanted to glide on by quietly. So again, it goes to show that there is an issue here. So again, we look at the two guys that were in this story here of Oppenheimer and Chris Langan. You saw and basically realized that one had the privilege, one didn't. One was a rich genius, one was a poor genius. And look how differently their lives turned out. Open hybrid grew up with the resources, Langan grew up with no resources. One was talking to PhD guys and students and different people when he was younger. One had a drunken father who hit him. So it kind of goes to show that the environment really does matter. And lastly, the book summarizes and talks about this really interesting study. And it was basically the study in where they talked about those termites. It goes back to the study in where the guy had all the students and it was 730 of them. So he took the top 120, the bottom 120, and the middle people. So in having the people A, B, and C labeled, he was saying A's were the lawyers, the doctors, super successful, B were the average, and C were the people who ended up not succeeding up to their expectations. Out of the bottom C people, only eight of them had college degrees, but all of them had IQs above that threshold. So he was wondering, what was the outlier here? Why are the top 150, all the lawyers and doctors and whatever it was with these high IQs, the middle were where they were and the last guys were only eight out of the 150 getting college degrees. That was pretty much the outlier. And again, it goes back to that topic of socioeconomic status and it goes back to their environment and their family. He did the same test and looked at all of them and then labeled them with the socioeconomic status and saw how correlated it was. So when you look at the family and the wealth that they had and the opportunities they were able to give their children, you obviously saw the difference where the richer intelligent kids were able to do everything they wanted to do. The middle class, they almost middle class and the poorer guys, it was hard for any of them to get to the next level of opportunity. Remember, Langan was a genius who didn't even graduate college, but his genius level was up there with all the best geniuses. So it went to show how intense the situation was and how important it is and how much it matters to have the influence of your family, your environment to be really positive for yourself to gain those opportunities. And that's what gets you the extra ed. And then the chapter ends with Chris Langan and just talks about how he lives on a humble farm with his wife and is happy and does his thing. And it ends with this really powerful quote. And the powerful quote goes that he'd have to make it on his way alone. Not rock stars, not professional athletes, not tech billionaires and CEOs, and not even geniuses can make it alone. Chapter five talks about a guy named Joe Flom, who was a Jewish lawyer. And it gives three lessons about this Jewish lawyer. And it talks about the different things that basically allowed him to become successful. And the first lesson that talks about in this chapter is the importance of being Jewish. And being Jewish in New York at this time was really important. They had this immigrant lifestyle. The immigrants all stayed together. They lived into each other. They lived in the ghettos together. There was a sense of community and building that they all did together. They all helped one another. And being Jewish at the time was really important because they all were part of the same culture. They were all part of the same vibe. So for example, a lot of them had these skills, these skills in order to make businesses happen. And a lot of these skills were things like clothes. His mom was able to make clothes and these moms were able to make clothes and the clothes fed for their home, fed for their business, fed for whatever it was. And they had this entrepreneur mindset and they stick together. So it showed that being Jewish in this area at that time was really helpful for themselves. And Joe Flom was basically able to succeed in this because then he didn't have to go into the more skill work. He was able to go to university. He was able to go to class. He was able to learn. And then having other Jewish people, they all helped one another. And this is really awesome to see how being part of that community took him to the next level. And then it 
obviously goes in and talks about the state of New York City's law firms and that no one really got into the grunge work, that dirty work where it was about acquisitions and mergers and takeovers and then company to company. But at the time, they got into that business and they were like, hey, let's actually go into this, even though it doesn't happen often, but let's go into it. They go into it, fast forward a bunch of years, it becomes hot and everyone's trying to do it. But at that point, he has how many hours of experience? So now he's one of the best lawyers at this game ever. He was a little rude, a little absurd and obnoxious and kind of talked over people and was rude. And it was said that he would fart in like cigarettes in people's faces and stuff like that. But it made him good at his job. He did what he had to do. But he also had years and years and years of practice before everyone else had it. He was early to the game. So then that's what in turn made them so successful. And then a bunch of law firms started copying his kind of strategy and what they were doing as well. But again, that all came from being together in this close-knit community and growing, growing, growing together. So again, he did that proxy work. He did that gritty, dirty work of lawyership. The stuff that nowadays is pretty regular. But back then, in the 1970s, it wasn't as popular. But again, it went from in the 1970s to the 80s, it went up 2,000% in this stuff of acquisitions, merges, and all these proxy wars in law. But again, he had 20 years of experience and the world caught up to him as he was growing. So again, being born in that time, being part of this experience in this environment of being a Jewish immigrant at the time and getting connections in the game, got, getting him into that law firm, getting him into those schools really helped. The second lesson is demographic luck. And it talks about the Jenklos. So when it talks about them, it talks about them in this regard. And it explains that the time you were born was really important. So in the 1930s to 40s, less kids were being born because of, again, what happened with the Great Depression earlier on. So less kids are being born in that frame rate. So that when they became teenagers or in the school system, there were less people in the school. So that means more teachers, less students, more learning opportunity. So again, small class sizes. It allowed them to learn a lot faster and get a lot more done. And again, the buildings at the time, the schools, they were built for a large generation at the time. But because of that unforeseen circumstance, it allowed there to be these excellent new buildings with less students. So they got more time to get more practice in and more time to whatever they needed to get done. It goes to show that in the time frame you're born, it's really important. The next part of this chapter talks about an Eastern European family that moved to the States around the 1890s. And again, they had those skills that I was talking about. When you have those skills, the craftsmanship they were able to do, they were able to sell. And this is a story that they told in the book. The family in focus is called Borgenick. And they're a pretty interesting family. So this family moves to an apartment in New York that was $8 a month for rent. And he had a sister who lived in New York for the last 10 years. So she loaned him out some fish and he went and sold that fish. And again, back and forth, back and forth to try to make some income to then basically get things going for himself. Until he realized and walked around, looked around the street and saw everyone's selling something, everyone's selling something. What is What are people not selling, but that is needed? So again, looking for that supply and demand, thinking like an entrepreneur, thinking like a business person, and then eventually using your skill set to help fund that. He kept seeing garment stores popping up. And again, garments, they had the skills of being able to sew. So when they came to the States, they opened up these garment stores. So then he thought, okay, what garments are people wearing all the time that aren't being sold yet? Aprons. The answer was aprons. So him and his wife are out there cooking up a storm, building aprons in the lab, cooking up all night. He went from 1 a.m. to 4 a.m. She went from 4 a.m. to 8 a.m. And they grinded these aprons out. Had 40. Next day, well, sells out. Next day, sells out. So they're cooking up these aprons. So then eventually, he keeps growing and growing the business until he starts building this clientele list of he's selling aprons. They were high quality. They were this. They were this. And then this, in turn makes them their first garment business. And then it talks about a bunch of different scenarios where it talks about the Mexican immigrant going to California to work and basically doing these skilled work and skilled labor that they needed or being a software engineer in 1980s. Again, having those 10,000 hours, those skills. So it kind of went to show that when you had those 10,000 hours, you had that skill set and you're in an area with the opportune time, boom, you can become successful at something because you have what's in demand. You have what's in need. You just have to utilize the skills that you have. An interesting quote within this chapter is hard work is a prison sentence if it doesn't have a reason or purpose. And it's interesting because the book kind of talks about entrepreneurship in a very positive light. And it goes show that being your own boss and how important that is. And then it talks about a family tree and that the family tree, there's a guy who ran it up and was a grocery store owner. And then by the time he had his three to five sons or kids, they all had a grocery store. But then those kids all became doctors, lawyers, engineers, because again, three generations down, they had the privilege, they had the ability to go out and do something a little more or go for certain levels of schooling because you had the money, the resources, the connections. So it goes to show putting in those hours, having the connections and building the legacy is really important. And again, 
having that nuclear close-knit family and that connective ability within your community allows you to get to that next level of success a lot faster. And the ending of this chapter has a really amazing stanza where it talks about success not being random, that it comes down to a very specific set of skills and how it's a powerful set of circumstances and opportunities. So again, being able to be born in a certain time frame to do a certain thing, to be able to be born within January to April, to be having these skills and the time, these opportunity things allow you to get to the next level of success so that you can get those 10,000 hours of practice. The chapter ends and summarizes with this sentence. Their world, their history, their generation was able to give them the highest level of success. Their world, their culture, generation, and family history gave them the greatest set of opportunities. Chapter six starts with a part two and it's titled Legacy. And the story starts with two feuding families in Harlan, Kentucky. And it talks about these two families and why they're feuding. And it talks about what they're feuding about. So many people are basically getting clipped. They were going into body bags. They were warring. These two families are feuding. But why? Why are they feuding? And then again, it started with disputes over what? What were they angry about? What was the problem? And they even had a mother telling her son, go die in battle. Be tough. Go, go be a man. And the thing is, this wasn't the only two families that were fighting. All up and down the Appalachian Mountain Trail, a bunch of families were getting into these fights and getting into these dilemmas. But what was it? It was a battle of honor. It was their honor they were fighting for. So the people who lived in these regions were all fighting for honor. They were battling for it. And what does this part of the story show us? So again, it kind of describes it as these weren't farmers, they were herders. And people who were herders always had the stress of potentially losing an animal. It was very hyper-individualistic. It was them and their animals' family. But farmers required working together. So again, being in these certain environments also made them more tough. It made them more culture of honor. They had to really be stressed in protecting their, their animals, their herd. The story again then goes in and talks to us about the Greece herding culture and how these are the type of people who had to quarrel. They had to fight. They had to beef with people. And again, this was the culture in a way. And most of the people who lived along these Appalachian mountain trails were Scottish and Irish immigrants who lived in the north of the UK. So again, it goes show even geographically the culture where they were from and why they acted this way. And then this is even described in the south versus the north in America. Southern people tend to have more fight for their honor more while the north people don't. They even had a sense of jury they had a jury in where they said, is he guilty? Is he not guilty? And the Northerners were like, yeah, he's just guilty. He shot him. But the Southerners were saying things like, oh, if he hadn't have shot him, then he hadn't been a man. You know, if he didn't shoot him, he ain't a man. So it's interesting to see the, the difference between the two groups. So again, this talks about cultural legacy, the honor, the difference between the two. So then it goes into a study. And then the study talks about a, a group of 18 year old guys. It had Northern and Southern 18 to 20 year old guys fill out this questionnaire. It basically had these guys walk down a hallway and someone would call them an a-hole and they would curse at them, yell at them and then slam a filing cabinet. And they measured their cortisol and testosterone levels in all of them after to see where they were at. They even then shook their hands to see like how firm it was and how they grabbed the hand. When it came to the Northerners, a lot of them were more calm, relaxed and even laughed about it and joked. But the Southerners, however, it was on sight. Their levels were all increased. They were a lot tenser. When they shook the hand, it was a lot tougher and tighter. So again, why was this the case when they took the Northerners and Southerners? Why are the Southerners always trying to beef, always trying to fight and escalate the situation? But none of their ancestors were herders. None of their ancestors were from Greece or Northern Ireland or Scottish. So why? What was the reason? How did they get this cultural legacy? What really happened? Because again, they were acting the same way the Harlan, Kentucky family feuds were. So why? And again, it goes back to that environment, the 10,000 hours of practical intelligence, what you learn, how you learn, the things around you. Those environmental experiences really do matter. So the book poses the question whether the traditions and attitudes that we get from our forebearers really do impact who we become. And can we use this to learn about why people succeeded and why people became who they became. And should we be taking cultural legacy seriously? I think we can. Chapter seven talks about the ethnic theory of plane crashes. Why do certain planes crash? Does it matter where you're born? Does it matter what culture you're from as to why the plane crashes? In this chapter, kind of dives in and talks about that. The chapter starts with the Korean air and how they had a 17 times chance more likely to crash. That sounds nuts. Why is it that they had so much more rate to crash than other airlines? They found the outlier. And once they found the outlier, they changed it and they went from one of the most dangerous airlines to the one of the most safe airlines. So what was it? A typical accident requires seven individual errors. So again, it's like simple errors, error, error, and they kind of snowballed down the drain. 
So what were these seven individual errors and how did they arise? It then goes into an American Airlines and how one had to fly all the way around Long Island and come back but then ran out of fuel. Another one that was just going too fast to the runway. So again, these are all human error mistakes. And maybe it's because they're tired. You miss things when you're tired. Your decision making goes down. But there had to be something more to it. There was a plane in where for 38 minutes they were running out of fuel and no one was ba basically explaining exactly where to do it. No one was taking charge or leadership. Why? Because again, it focuses on this human exhaustion, the communication factor, and how much more important the communication factor was than anything. And this is the part that we're going to focus on. It talks about a successful plane emergency landing and where there's so many things going on. There was someone on the airplane that needed medical attention. All these different things were happening. A guy who had to talk to the Helsinki airport, this airport, this airport to make sure to know how to do it and how to land it. But what really helped was the levels of communication, the calmness, the ability to communicate, talk about it. Be really relaxed and know where to go and what to do next. Then the book talks about a transcript of an airline and it shows the transcript basically and it, within the transcript it constantly shows gaps of silence, gaps of communication. And you go to wonder maybe that's why that plane crashed or maybe that's why that plane didn't have the best experience. Why? Because there was gaps of communication and gaps of silence where they needed to be communicating but they weren't. So why? So linguists talk about this. And again, within different cultures, there's different ways to say things, mitigated ways to say something to someone if they might be wrong or they might be doing something. So for example, if my captain is someone who would slap me in the face, if I spoke out of turn, then odds are I may not be speaking out of turn. I may not be like, hey, captain, we got to do this. But in places in where you had that better relationship, that communication level, where it wasn't rude to cut off your captain, your superior person higher in rank than you, then you didn't have that problem. You're able to communicate. So this kind of goes to show that at first you say, hey, uh, maybe we should do this, or you drop in the hint. But again, sometimes you can't just keep dropping a hint, then the next one, the next one, until they finally get it. Sometimes you have to be blunt. Sometimes you have to be direct. So it kind of goes to show that that was a main factor and main outlier in where certain cultures around the world cause more airplane crashes because of that level of communication. They actually found and studied that the, when someone who was less experienced was flying the plane, there was actually less crashes. Because again, when someone less experienced doesn't want to tell someone who's more experienced, it has more tenure, more experienced miles driving, tell them what to do. So again, it goes to show again, that levels of communication, the levels of confidence within people to be able to speak up and say, what needs to be said. And they did these studies and showed the individualism scale. And USA being one of the highest countries, go figure, of individualism. But Guatemala is seen as one of the lowest. So does that mean that Guatemalans are more likely to crash a plane than Americans? So again, it kind of goes to show that you have to have some sort of ability to stand up for what you need to say. So no matter what experience, no matter what culture you're in, when you're doing this airplane traveling, you have to find a way to get it to work. So again, it talks about a bunch of different countries and it talks about the countries that do and don't basically are really direct. The countries that are super direct and countries that are ambiguous. Countries that aren't very direct about the way they communicate things. The ones that are dropping hints versus the ones that aren't. And then it talks about a transcript about a Korean flight. And it was this, he talking about the guy who was like, oh, the weather map surely looks interesting, doesn't it? But he was basically trying to say, yo, we should look at the weather map because we're going to go into really bad weather and we can crash. But again, that level of ambiguity, the hinting, was there as out of respect rather than saying exactly what he really was thinking. So again, this chapter basically talks about because they started noticing that this was the real problem and the real outlier, that they made sure that from now on and then airplanes got this resource. They understood that this is a problem to make sure that we have a third party person within the cockpit because having all the different personalities within the cockpit, we're able to have less accidents, less crashes and more communication so that this doesn't happen again. Chapter eight starts with a quote and the quote is stated as no one who can rise 360 days out of the year before dawn fails to make his family rich. And honestly, this is powerful. And me being a Muslim, you pray Fajr, the first prayer of the day, it's supposed to be really early. And they always say that there's blessing in that dawn time, that morning time, which kind of makes sense. Because if you're waking up early, you're at it, you're focused, you have the whole day ahead of you to grind. So it goes to show, it's even in that story, it says when you wake up early and you're grinding, you're gonna be successful. You're gonna make it out. You're gonna do something with that time. And again, it's talking about Chinese farmers and the rice fields. So again, when it talks about these rice fields and talks about the grind they have to put in, you have to carve it into the mountains. So again, it's a lot of effort, a lot of hard work. 
And then it talks about the number system in Cantonese and how you say these numbers, it's a lot easier to say these numbers and remember numbers in a row because of the letters and the syllables that are required in Cantonese to say numbers like four, eight, nine, six, seven versus saying in English. It helps them remember numbers better. So again, within this culture, within the Chinese culture of people who were farmers in the rice field, they believed that hard work, discipline, resistance, consistency was gonna get them yields in their rice fields. They couldn't just rely on God. Being a Muslim person, you always believed in say things like pray for things, but also work for it at the same time. Don't sit there and just pray and hope that everything works out, but you gotta put in the work. So it's cool to see how different cultures synonymously work together for the same concept. So then it goes back to culture. So it's basically trying to explain within this chapter that why are Asians so good at math? Is it just a stereotype? Why is that immigrants come from other countries, come to America and become so successful and more than half of all Fortune 500 companies are run by an immigrant at this point? Why? Because again, when they come abroad, they have the sense of discipline, hard work. Even when it comes to mathematics, to be good at math, it's not just the requirement of IQ or analytical intelligence, but it's do you give up when the problem is hard? Do you give up? Do you quit? Yes or no. And that's what this, the book is basically explaining here. That, that hard work, that persistence is what gets you to be good at math. And that's why Asians are good at math. Not just because they're Asian, but because their culture, their ethnicity, their values allow them to never give up, never quit, so that in turn, they don't give up at a math problem. They don't give up at this problem. So in turn, theoretically better at math. See the point here? And then it talks about a different study here where the guy, he takes a woman named Renee and he tells her to do this math problem, slope, rise over run. And she spends 22 minutes trying to figure it out. And he kind of realized that the best attitude, the best statistic of learning is having a good attitude. When you have a good attitude and you want to learn, you want to make sure you get it done, even when it sucks, now that's how you're going to be successful. That's how you get to the next level. And that was really interesting because when I thought about this genuinely, I was like, it's true. Like when you give up, that's it. You lose. If you never give up, you never lose. So that's again, I guess something I took from the book and genuinely I like that. Like I was sitting there like, yo, that's a dope part of this book. So again, the end of this chapter basically talks about the fact that these certain nations and countries that had these rice fields and people who worked really hard and were farmers that were tending to the land, they really were the people who became the most successful in mathematics and other things because they did have that never give up mentality. So listen, if you're watching this, you're seeing this, remember, never give up. Because then if you give up, you quit, that's it, you lose. Don't lose the game. Keep going. Don't give up. And again, it goes back to that quote that we saw at the beginning of the book. He who was able to rise 360 days out of the year before dawn will not fail to make his family rich. Chapter 9. This chapter is titled Marita's Bargain. And it basically talks about the KIPP school in New York. And this school is basically a school that has extra hours, extra abilities. And it takes a lot of lower income students and families. It basically says, hey, you guys can come to the school, but this is the system that we're going to have in place. They spend a lot more hours in school. They spend a lot more hours doing things, but because of that, in turn, actually end up going to colleges more often than other schools. They work a lot harder and do more work, but having that structured work allows them to be more successful. So again, it goes to show that level of increasing hours and increasing time practicing allows them to be more successful. And again, this school is again one of the most desirable schools to be part of in New York City. Because again, the statistic of these kids going off to colleges and really great universities is super high. And again, within this school, it shows the achievement gap, where again, the low to socioeconomic students versus middle versus high class students, and shows the gap. Lower class students tend not to learn more over the summer. Middle class students, very similar. But the wealthier, higher class students were learning like crazy. Their reading scores are jumping to the moon. So it goes to show that going into nerd camps over the summer, doing those extracurricular activities over the summer, and constantly learning allowed for them to become way more intelligent and having more of those reading skills and knowledge. So again, learning can't just happen in the four walls of school, but it has to happen after school. It has to happen during the summer. There needs to be learning that happens all the time for a child to constantly be growing. Remember, when you have sunlight on the sea, it allows it to grow, but you have to be able to give it that level of sunlight. And this chapter really dives into focuses on that topic. And again, think about the Chris Langan chapter where his socioeconomic status and not being able to do things because again, having a really crappy childhood didn't allow him to have those practical intelligence skills. And me personally, I did nerd camps growing up. I did something called Summer Bridge, something called CTY, Center for Talented Youth from Johns Hopkins University. And it was awesome. I learned bioethics courses. I took an introduction to logic course, a race and politics course. 
a psychology course. And these are three week college level courses from literally like what, seventh grade to junior year of high school. Awesome experience. I had to take the SAT in seventh grade to qualify for it. So going into my eighth grade year, I took this summer course. And to this day, I'll always look back on it and think the people I met at those camps were sometimes sons and daughters of billionaires. Sometimes some of them were sons of women who owned a magazine. And it's like, you saw different levels of entrepreneurs, successful people. But then also, yeah, some people who are immigrants from Hong Kong, India, China, who came over because they were geniuses. So being around those types of people allowed me to think this way, allowed me to think more. So I started thinking about this more and more and thought, when I was reading this book, it made me realize that these outliers do matter. It makes sense. And we have to understand that these outliers in our lives do allow us to get to the next level. They do allow us to basically boss up because you're doing things that require it. And it's a very simple way to think about this is if you want friends that will hike all the time, go hiking all the time. You'll run into people who hike all the time. And it's like you like people who bowl. Go bowling all the time. You'll find people who are always bowling all the time. Again, it's super, super simple, but it's hard to apply. And again, this book really dives into it. And this chapter really talks about it through the KIPP school in New York. And it really talks about this because it's like, hey, look how many hours they're putting in. These are low income students. These are immigrant students. These are majority black and Hispanic students. But look at how now they're all going to universities and colleges that are prestigious. So it goes to show when you put in the time, you put in the effort, you get the success and the reward. It even talks about Asian schools and that the average amount of Asian schooling there is in the year is 243 days. The average American school is 180 days. So then we want go to wonder why some of these students are smarter than American students because they're in more school. It just makes sense. If you put the same American students with the same amount of hours, they'll be at the same levels of intelligence and knowledge and learning. Because again, it requires a time put in. It requires your 10,000 hours. And this book really dives into that. And it really separates the storyline of, oh, it's just because they're this. It's because they're this. No, it requires the opportunity, the work ethic, the grind, the hours put in. And there's no excuse that. But again, it also explains that it's no such thing as self-made. You need those opportunities. You need that ability to be part of the society, this culture, this environment. And again, it talks about that in multiple chapters. And again, the book is summarizing and showing that we all just need a chance, a chance to show our potential, a chance to grow, a chance to learn. After reading this book, it really has shown me more in focus and more innately that we all have a genius inside of us. But are we living up to that potential? Are we going for the moon, the stars? Are we shining bright? Is the work being done? Yes or no? And again, it's about doing the most with the opportunity that we have. The final chapter, the epilogue, is talks about a Jamaican story. And this final chapter talks about Malcolm Gladwell and his mother and this story that she goes through. And it talks about how he was who he was and what opportunities got to him because of his mother's opportunities. And he goes in depth about his mother's opportunities in Jamaica. It talks about his mother's path to success and what made her successful. There was a historian who visited the island named William McMillan. And this guy was from South Africa and he came to this area in this country and he was looking at different things and it was like, hmm, how are these people gonna be successful? What are opportunities here? And again, got the people thinking. And this historian was super concerned about the problem in South Africa and with how the black people were getting treated. And then he came to Jamaica and saw a very similar thing and wanted to help fix this problem. And he realized in Jamaica, there was no public schools. It was just barn door education where it's like, oh, everyone goes to so-and-so's house and learn math today or do this today. So again, at the time, Macmillan had basically gotten these tests in Jamaica and he had got these kids to take these tests. So Gladwell's mother and his, his her twin sister were able to take this test. Fast forward, his twin sister, her twin sister was passing, got in, but she didn't get in for the scholarship. But then someone had dropped out or backed out, so then she got it. So again, it showed that it required a little bit of luck and a little bit of opportunity that this historian came to Jamaica at the same time that she was there. So again, it requires that being born in this area, but also taking chance of the opportunities that you have and a little bit of luck going in place. But again, to get lucky, just work hard and get the things done. Go after those opportunities. So again, it goes to show that his mother had to thank basically the Macmillan guy, then the girl who didn't take the scholarship, then to the person who paid for her to be able to go and do those things that first year. And again, it's all these little steps along the way that allow you to, boom, become the person you are and to become successful. So the book basically summarizes and ends with even talking about Joe Flom and different types of people within the story. And it talks about all of them. And it basically shows that it requires this environmental pressure, this legacy, the cultural heritage, where you're from, what your family does, the environment, everything, the socioeconomic aspect. Is there racism? Is there not? Is there opportunity? Is there not? And it goes to show that no matter what it takes, no matter what it is, you yourself have to find the outliers that are currently in your life. 
the outlier in your life that you can take advantage of that can get you to become successful and can get you to get to the next level. And after reading this book, it really did enlighten me and realize like that this is true. Like these statistics can lie. It's there in front of us. We need to take advantage of every opportunity we have. And then the harder we work, the luckier we get. This book talks about the lawyers, the business tycoons, the software engineers, these billionaires, successful artists, musicians. And it explains and talks about how they're not just these extraordinary people who just went through this and were so gifted and naturally talented. Maybe they're just an athlete who was born from January to April who then had the opportunity to do these things and play the sport. The success is not exceptional or mysterious. It is grounded and rooted in an ability to have these opportunities, an ability to make do with what you have. And it is grounded in the web of advantage and inheritance that some deserve, some don't. And some just get plain lucky. And all of this and then makes them who they are. And then when you think about it, the outlier at the end just isn't an outlier at all. Thank you guys again for tuning into this. I really did like doing this. It was awesome to again talk about the book Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. And it was a really entertaining book and I genuinely really enjoyed it. And I look forward for you guys to read it and really dive into it. Because again, I genuinely think the book was just great to look at the statistics and see how it requires a 10,000 hours. It requires us to change our environment. You want to change your environment. You want to change the things that are around you. And all in all, I would definitely recommend this book. It was awesome, a great read. I'll put the link in the description below. Check out Malcolm Gladwell's other books. Again, great author, really entertaining read. I'll see you guys next time with another book review. And if you guys want me to review a book that maybe you've read and really liked and enjoyed, leave it in the comments down below so that I can read it and get into it. Thank you guys again for tuning in. I'll see you next time.